Hey guys, Sean here. Welcome to the F1 Word and to the preview for the 2022 Emilia Romagna Grand Prix. Yes, it is race week once again. And as if that wasn't enough to excite you all, it's also a sprint weekend, the first one of the season. I know, right? Very exciting. And of course, there are changes to the sprint for 2022, and I'll go over those a little bit later in this video. Now, Imola is one of my favorite tracks. I think I've mentioned that one a few times. And so even if there is the risk of things getting a little bit processional this weekend, it is a tight and twisty track. I honestly still can't wait to see this new era of cars on that classic track. Plus, it's been a pretty awesome start to the season for the most part anyway. And so I really hope that continues this weekend. But enough of all of that, let's jump straight into this preview, kicking off with a look at the usual round of track stats and everything that follows. So last time out, F1 was in Australia to race for the first time since 2019, but now it's on to the Autodromo Enzo Adino Ferrari to give it its full name, although I will be calling it Imola for the rest of the weekend for round four of the 2022 F1 season. A lap of the famous track is 4.909 kilometers long. That is just over three miles if you'd prefer. And it's made up of a total of 19 corners. And on Sunday, the race will run for a total of 63 laps. Now, last preview, I told you there were four zones for Albert Park. That was eventually reduced to three. But this weekend in Imola, a track that is just as notoriously difficult to pass on thanks to its short straights and high-speed corners. In fact, according to Aston Martin, just 12 overtakes after lap one last season. We are getting just the one DRS zone this weekend, and that runs from just before turn 19 all the way to that first chicane. And if I remember correctly, it felt a little bit short last year, so I kind of wish they'd maybe moved that up a little bit a little bit closer to the exit of turn 18 the race that record was set by lewis hamilton in 2020 as he posted a 115.484 on lap 63 and actually last year's race fastest that was about 1.3 seconds slower but as i'm sure you'll remember it was a rain affected race and so that was set on a drying track or a track that wasn't optimal grip at least Max Verstappen, of course, going on to take victory that weekend leading home lewis hamilton and lando norris in a pretty chaotic race Okay, look, I, I can't contain this anymore. I am so excited. I will try to compose myself because it's time to talk tires. I'm sorry, the, the, the sarcasm will bog off eventually. The compounds available for this weekend are right down the middle of the Pirelli range, and they are the hard C2, the medium C3, and the soft C4. And just a heads up, the intermediates and wets will be available as always this weekend and could well be needed at some stage. More on that in just a moment. Pirelli did not decide to skip a compound for this weekend as they did last time out. And the manufacturer explained that that's because the asphalt is much older at Imola than the fresh surface at Albert Park. And so therefore the surface is more mature, which means more grip leading to more heat in the compound. And that all means that a more robust compound is needed when it comes to the softest option. Strategy is an interesting one. The pit lane loss time is fairly high, around 28 seconds again, according to Aston Martin. And so teams are definitely going to want to make as few stops as possible. That said, historically, we tend to see quite low degradation at Imola, so that might not be an issue. Although, as is the case with probably most races this year, we have to remember that these cars are totally different this year, and so are the tyres. So that may not be the case this weekend. We shall see, of course, but I am fully expecting a one stopper unless we see a safety car, which is possible because we saw one in 2020 and two last year. But it must be said, we didn't tend to see safety cars at Imola prior to the track's return a couple of years ago. As already touched on, the weather could also play its part this weekend and the forecast at time of recording is, I think it's fair to say, mixed. Rain is currently expected to hit the track on Friday, but the chance of rain percentage varies depending on the forecast, which is often the case, to be fair, with some saying it's around 71% for FP1 and 43% for qualifying, with others saying it's as high as 89% and as low as 30% respectively. Point is, though, rain is forecast, which could make Friday qualifying very interesting indeed. It might mix the weekend up a little bit. Saturday is expected to stay dry with highs of 18 degrees for FP2 and 20 degrees for the sprint. And when it comes to the race, it is expected to stay dry from lights out onwards. However, forecasts currently say rain could fall for a couple of hours before the race. So we may well end up with a damp start on Sunday. But again, the chance of it falling varies from forecast to forecast. I like to keep the weather in these previews, but I must admit it often feels a little bit pointless given that this is recorded on a Wednesday evening. Things are definitely going to change before the weekend. And your schedule for the weekend is pretty much what you'd expect from a race in Europe, although there are, of course, changes due to it being the first sprint of the year. 
FP1 kicks things off at Imola from 12.30 BST on Friday afternoon. And don't forget, it's qualifying on Friday as well. And that session gets underway from 4 p.m. FP2 is on Saturday morning and that starts at 11.30 and both practice sessions are still one hour long. That doesn't change for sprint weekends, we just lose a session. So not a lot of practice time for teams this time around. The sprint takes place later on Saturday afternoon from 3.30 and on Sunday it is lights out for the race at 2pm and once again that is in UK time. Now, before I get on to the flashback and my predictions, let's have a look at some of the talking points and or some stories to take note of ahead of this weekend. First up, Think have mentioned it in this video. The sprint is back this weekend, but there have been some changes to the format. The biggest one is undoubtedly around how the points will be awarded on Saturday. Now, previously, the top three drivers were given something with three for the winner, two for second and one for third. However, this year, points will be handed out to the top eight drivers with eight points going to the driver who takes first place on Saturday, seven points for the driver in P2 and six points for the driver in P3. And then it's five, four, three, two and down to one point for the eighth place finisher. I wonder if that will encourage drivers to perhaps make a move that they wouldn't have done in a sprint race last year. We shall see, of course. The winner of the sprint will no longer be awarded the title of pole position, with that now going to the driver who sets the fastest qualifying time on Friday. However, the sprint will still determine the grid for the race proper on Sunday, meaning we could be in a position where the driver who was awarded pole position doesn't actually start the race from pole position on Sunday. Because, you know, F1 things. Let me give you an example. If the driver who takes P1 on Friday goes on to finish second place in the sprint and the driver who qualified second on Friday wins the sprint, then Friday's top qualifier would still be credited with pole position despite starting the Grand Prix from second on the grid behind the sprint race winner. Basically, the fastest driver in qualifying starts P1 for the sprint and gets the title of pole position, but the winner of the sprint will start the race on Sunday at the front of the grid. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'm all for change and F1 moving with the times and trying to engage new fans, but Jesus H. Corbett. The name of the session is also now just sprint and not sprint qualifying, but it is still a race, although they're not calling it a race, even though it is a race, but you know, shh. And the other venues hosting these not races later this year are the Red Bull Ring and Interlagos. Teams have also been allocated more money for each of these sprint events. Moving on, and some teams have asked F1 bosses and the FIA to consider rethinking how teams work together with some rivals questioning whether or not the Haas team has benefited too much from its ties with Ferrari. As we know, Haas has bought as many parts from Ferrari as possible within the regulations in the past and has gone on to forge an even closer partnership recently, setting up a Maranello-based hub as well as taking on a number of former Ferrari staff. Despite concerns, though, the FIA is fully satisfied that the partnership is all above board, but that hasn't stopped teams calling for the rules to be tightened up in the future. Toto Wolff says he thinks it needs reform because, quote, we want to avoid these kinds of discussions that we have now, adding that whilst credit should be given to those who do a good job, again, quote, some of the job hopping and entity hopping on the same premises is just creating arguments that are not necessary for the sport. Andreas Seidel has had his say as well and actually wants F1 to take a stronger approach on this, saying the maximum that should be allowed to be shared between teams is power units and gearbox internals. However, Frederick Vasseur disagrees and feels that there is no need to change the regulations, adding that they are strict enough to ensure it is fair. Perhaps as you'd expect, it has all been brushed off by Gunther Steiner, though, stating that all that matters is the FIA is satisfied with the team's relationship with Ferrari. Keep an eye on this one, though. It could rumble on, although expect to see it fall incredibly silent if Haas suddenly end up right at the back of the grid for some reason again. And finally for this part, Christian Horner has cool talk that Red Bull could be set to bring a massive upgrade package to Imola, instead saying that the new parts are merely an evolution, adding that because it is a sprint weekend, there is less time to evaluate new parts. And so, quote, you've got to be very confident about what you're putting on the car. And Helmut Marco told RTL that Red Bull will have a small package of updates on the car this weekend at Imola. Horner's words are very much in line with what Mattia Bonotto said a couple of weeks ago as he played down the chance of the team bringing big updates to the F175 this weekend. And according to Motorsport Italy, the Scuderia will not bring its updated floor to Imola due to, again, the sprint, but also the possibility of rain. Alfa Tauri is bringing a couple of updates to its car this weekend. Noam Pierre Gasly has described them as a big test for the team and is hopeful they bring the performance they are expecting. And Alpine boss Otmar Safnauer said last week that his team is planning to bring significant aero updates to Imola and says he expects most teams to bring something which probably isn't going to surprise too many of you because I reckon we're going to see updates from most teams most weekends this year. 
Moving on, though, Imola is such an historic track, and there are so many stories that could be told, both good and, of course, sadly, tragic. But this week, I want to go over one of the most incredible on-track battles I ever saw at Imola, maybe even in F1. So let's flash back to the 2005 San Marino Grand Prix. Kimi Raikkonen would start the race on pole position and manage to keep the lead as he pulled out an early gap to the rest of the field. However, on lap 9, the Finns suffered drive shaft issues and slowed on track, handing the lead to Fernando Alonso. The Spaniard was fairly comfortable for much of the race, although Jensen Button did put up a good charge. But come lap 50, Michael Schumacher, who had started the race down in 13th, came out of the pits following his second stop right behind the Renault and was breathing down his neck, trying to snatch the lead away. The battle continued all the way to the flag with the two drivers nose to tail for the final 12 laps, but Alonso put up a truly phenomenal defensive drive and stayed cool under immense pressure to keep the seven-time world champion at bay and take the San Marino Grand Prix victory, just two tenths of a second between them over the line. Honestly, I could watch that all day long. Absolutely incredible stuff. Not that we in the UK got to see all of it, of course, as ITV famously cut to a commercial break in the closing stages. There was some big controversy post-race, as well as Jensen Button's BAR was found to be under the minimum weight limit when all fuel, including that in the secondary tank, was drained from the car. That word again was secondary. Don't know why I struggled with that one. Anyway, initially, Stewart cleared the team of any wrongdoing, but the FIA appealed and the matter ended up in court. Eventually, both Button and Sato were disqualified from the event and BAR was handed a two-race ban. But whilst that was a huge story at the time, it was massive. Imola 2005 will always be remembered, by me at least, for that stunning battle between Fernando Alonso and Michael Schumacher. It did have a feeling of changing of the guard, just a little bit. And there were plenty of battles between them two over the next two years that kind of added to that. Right then, it is predictions time. As ever, please don't take these too seriously. They are just a little bit of fun. And if you disagree with my picks, then you can let me know yours in the comment section down below. And based on my last set of predictions, you definitely should be disagreeing with me. What a shocker. I was wrong on pole, the winner of the podium, although Checo did get a podium, just not P3. I did get fastest that right though, and my pick of Mercedes for podium outsiders came good too. So not all bad, but pretty much terrible. But despite my miserable attempt last time, I'm going to mix things up a tiny bit this weekend. I'm not going to play too safe, although you might still say it's fairly safe. I mean, look, I still fully expect to see Ferrari versus Red Bull round four. I mean, they clearly are the top two teams right now. But I'm going to go with a big bounce back from Carlos Sainz. And I'm going to say the Spaniard has pretty much the perfect weekend and gets pole position on Friday. He goes on to win the sprint on Saturday. And given how tough it is to overtake Imola, say that he will even go on to take victory. I'm not sure on the rest of the podium though, but I think I'll go with Max Verstappen for P2 on Sunday and Charles Leclerc third with Sergio Perez not a million miles behind. I really do think it's going to be very close between those four drivers, those two teams this weekend. If the rain falls in qualifying on Friday though, that could mix things up a little bit. But I think even with rain, it wouldn't necessarily open the door too much to a shock pole from elsewhere. What I will say though is never rule Lewis Hamilton out in the wet. He could be the one to stun us all on Friday. And again, hey, overtaking is tough at Imola. So if, for example, Hamilton could take pole on a wet Friday, he might even be able to fend off those behind. Obviously, a lot of ifs and buts and maybes there, so let's move on. But just Keep an eye on that one. It could be the variable we need to spice things up even more. As for my outsiders for a podium, I'm actually going to go with Alpine. They were a real surprise in Melbourne. And what could have been without those mechanical issues in qualifying for Alonso? Oh, it's gutted for him. So if we do get some drama ahead, I'm going to go with a surprise Alonso podium. But honestly, that will probably be reliant on a little bit of chaos. And my bolder prediction for the weekend is that we see both Haas drivers and Alex Albon in the points on Sunday. And you know, yeah, Aston Martin pick up points in Saturday sprint because, you know, why not? Before I go, I don't like doing this, but before I go and whilst I'm on predictions, I do want to reiterate the it's just a bit of fun disclaimer I say every week. I often get the odd comment on how it's foolish or whatever to make predictions at this stage, but to be quite frank, I don't see the point in doing them after we've seen cars on track because that makes it much easier. I'd have absolutely nailed last race's predictions if I'd done them post-practice. And at the end of the day, it's not like I'm claiming to be a clairvoyant or anything, or am I? Just call me Septic Peg. 
Anyway, what a weird end to a preview. That is it for the Amelia Romagna Grand Prix preview then. But you can, as always, let me know your thoughts and your predictions ahead of the weekend in the comment section down below. Now, I will be back soon with another video. And don't forget to join me and Dan. Yes, he's back live after the race on Sunday for the usual reaction stream. In the meantime, though, if you did enjoy this one, then please do leave a like as it really does help the channel out. And don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on any future content. But as ever, thank you for watching. I've been Septic Peg. This has been the F1 Word. And until next time, goodbye.